Guitar Business Radio is the podcast for the business of guitar, where you'll always get no reviews, no demos, and no idle chatter. From players to CEOs and in between, if you have a professional or business connection to the world of guitar, this show is your window to insight and information you won't get anywhere else. I'm Jeffrey D. Brown, and I approve this message. So let's get to it. From Guitar Business Media, welcome to the 66th episode of GBR, the show that offers you a lot of substance and some style, but mostly substance, that you won't get anywhere else. So thanks for joining us today. We're back with our regular format today with Ken Haas, CEO of Reverend Guitars, for a lively and quite detailed interview, and we'll get to that in just a moment. So for the last couple of weeks, we've presented you with the first two volumes of our fabulous, amazing intros series, which, to my pleasant surprise, were very well received and listened to. So we'll be doing a few more of those later on when we have to fill in for me on occasion, which doesn't happen very often. But when it does, it's nice to know that we have something that can fill in for me. It's kind of like having a guest host without the guest host, I guess, because I'm still there, kind of, sort of. But it's kind of fun doing those because as I'm putting them together, it kind of gives me a chance to refamiliarize myself with the episode, which can easily go out of focus when you're doing a new show every week, while at the same time running a business, living a life, and, you know, everything in between. And I think that sort of thing is always good for us. And I've talked about it before. You know, it's helpful to remind ourselves what we've accomplished from time to time so that if the time comes that for some reason we're thinking, geez, I don't feel like I'm accomplishing anything or nothing is falling into place, which by the way, usually means I haven't accomplished anything or nothing has fallen into place in say the last two hours. Isn't that what it usually is? Anyway, It helps at those times to take a longer view of things, so while you're compassionately examining your past efforts, let's move on to something completely different. So my guest on GBR today is none other than Ken Haas, the CEO of Reverend Guitars. He's had a connection to Reverend Guitars in one way or another for a couple of decades, first as a player and ultimately buying the company and building it into the business it is today. There's a lot of details to cover, so let's get to it, as Ken Haas joins us right here and right now. Hey, Ken, thanks so much for uh, coming on the show with us today from, I I think, Toledo, Ohio, uh, if I'm correct. Sunny, sunny, beautiful Toledo, Ohio. And welcome to GBR. It's great to have you on. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Well, this is where we talk about foundational uh, topics, and I kind of make fun of it a little bit now because I've been doing this over and over again. I kind of got stuck into it, so now I just kind of do it. It's not really tongue-in-cheek, but um, (laughs) we go for it anyway. But typically, it's, you know, I like to, to find out what things may have occurred in your youth, you know, basically the time prior to join in the workforce that may have impacted or influenced you and helped you get to where you are today. So what can you tell us about that? Well, I, uh, let's see. Oh, that's a tough one. You got to go way back. Boy, I, you know, yeah, we got to go way back. Probably not as far uh, as I'd have to go back, but I mean, it's a way. Yeah, it's still, still, we're talking early 80s. I was, when I was, I don't want to start our whole interview on like a real bummer thing here. Well, well, we've Um, done it before. But my, when I, in my, in my, when, in the early eighties, when I was 10 years old, my favorite uncle passed away, my uncle Mike, and he was a guitar player uh, in the Detroit metro area who had a few interesting twists and turns in his career and did a few national things, but mostly he was just a, a local musician around the Detroit area and he had some substance abuse issues and some other things. And he, he burned out early. Um, Mm. you know, he ended up sort of giving up on his music career and working midnights in a factory and then passing away too young. Mm. And of course I watched the impact that it had on my, my grandparents and the rest of my family and things. And, um, he had, um, 
he he had many guitars in his arsenal that I've seen in pictures. Some a really neat three thirty and and uh, uh, you know uh, double neck and wow. and a lot a lot of cool Gibson things that that he got rid of. But when he passed away, um, he had a sixty eight Tele and a sixty five Twin, and those two instruments hung out in the bedroom of my grandparents' house, and they did the thing where they didn't like they didn't go through his stuff for years. You know, mm-hmm. it was just very thing you know it was a very heavy thing you know um and as as a kid i used to just go over and i'd pull the telly out from under the bed and I'd, I'd slide the case out on the hardwood floor i can i can see it i can smell everything about that experience you know and i would just open the case and sit on the floor and stare at it like that was uh. mike's guitar you know and and um it was it was awesome i you know and and i love that guitar i still have that guitar i still have the twin the twin is here at reverend um, I had it recapped a couple of years ago and had a, a really good tech go through it and set it up because of course, well, if, back to the original part of the story. So I'm a, eventually as I became a teenager, uh, I took guitar lessons and I was uninspired at first. I had a nylon string acoustic, which is not what one does for rock. Yeah. And, That's tough. and I, I couldn't get into the, the, the lesson thing. And I ended up sort of dropping it like 12 year olds do 13 year olds do, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, exactly. But I kept, every time I would visit my grandparents, I would sit there and stare at that guitar. And one day my grandfather caught me looking at it and, and, and I was, I was like, Oh, this is a, you know, what are we going to, am I going to get in trouble or whatever? And he just looked at me and he said, you know, I think it's about time you took that home. And I was like, whoa. And that inspired me to play guitar. And, and then I just sat around with the Telecaster playing along the, you know, at first, you know, Sabbath records and Led Zeppelin two and stuff and figuring little things out. And then I got really super into punk rock and, then I realized, of course, that the Telecaster wasn't what I needed to do some of the things I was doing. And I moved on to, you know, Ibanez guitars and things like that. And then you went down this whole big musical path. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the Tele always stayed with me. Um, and like I said, the twin stayed with me. I, I use it in a lot of demo videos here at Reverend. Now, um, it's a it's a killer instrument. It's funny you, I, should, uh, you, you mentioned that. And I was as you were telling that story, I was kind of thinking yeah. back to I had basically that same setup. I, I'm going to go back and say that I had probably a, a 65 Tele and a probably about a 65 Twin. It was right about that time that I, I got those. The Tele was a was actually a custom order in those days. It was a candy apple red and a, a two-piece maple neck. And um, that's all you could get at that time was they were just starting to you know make the maple necks again but uh that was mm-hmm, mm-hmm. quite a combination i was just i hadn't thought about that in a long time but uh but and you still have it yeah you know at the time i didn't know what to do with a clean guitar like that you know that's not what i wanted to do as a teenager i i wanted you know all the music that i was listening to where the guys were you know cranking 50 watt marshals and playing with a lot of gain and things of that nature sure, and sure. you know i in that Telly was was clean all the way up to ten, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and you know the 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 rap pedal that sounds so killer with the junior didn't really sound as good with the Paul, you know, mm-hmm. and so um, mm-hmm. they're with the with the Telly. But yeah. at any rate, um, it's still it's still it's it's interesting because when I look back on it now, and and I don't do this. Uh, I, I don't do what I do as a non non accomplished musician. I mean, I've been playing in bands for 35 years. I I, I tour with bands. Um, I, I'm in a great band called Jay Navarro and the Traders, and we have we have music and records coming out all the time. Where uh, Jay was the leader of Detroit band called the Suicide Machines, which is still out there. A great mm-hmm. great ska punk band, and mm-hmm. we do a more traditional blend of ska and reggae and punk rock and stuff. And I toured Japan last year. I'm going to England this year. Wow. I nice. do things. I do things as a musician that don't have anything to do with what I do for a living. Like, yes, I'm. I'm not in these bands to promote Reverend Guitars or I'm not in these bands because of Reverend Guitars. You know, I, I'm I'm a musician and then the Reverend Guitars thing came along 
you know, uh, at, on the side of that. And, and I, I, some, sometimes I blend the two things together. Sometimes I'll take a band in Nashville or something and, mm-hmm. and, and, you know, open for one of endorsing friends of mine or whatever. But most of the time, you know, they're, they're just separate entities. That being said, when I look back on looking at the telly on the floor, my first love was for the guitar and not for the music that was created by the guitar and not the desire to play the guitar necessarily. You know, I would just, I would just hold it in my lap and look at it. You were in and love with the, I- the idea of it, right? <laughs> yes. And eventually when I took it home, you know, I took it apart because it oh. had, it, it, well, he had a, believe it or not, it's still in there, a PAF humbucker in there, a real Gibson PAF wow. that came out of a 335 in the early 60s, one of his other guitars. And he mined this neck pickup out of a Gibson and he routed this telly with a screwdriver to put this oh. neck pickup in it. Wow. You know, and so underneath the pick guard, it was ugly. Yeah, I can imagine. But, <laughs> but now the pickup is worth more than the guitar is. No. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Yeah. You know, it's the, the, all, the vintage stuff is hilarious and I'm, I'm into it and I pay attention to it and stuff. And I, you know, I enjoy all those, those facets of it. But even that, like that sort of got me fascinated. And the fact, like how close I came to throwing that pickup away yeah. in the eighties, yeah. like not knowing what it was, you know what I mean? But I knew yeah. that it looked different than the pictures of the Telecasters that I saw in the magazines. And and then I started figuring out, well, this was a, a tone that he was looking for. And I started listening to his recordings and he was really into Wes Montgomery and he was really into a lot of jazz stuff. And he would play a lot of that stuff on his on his telly. It was really it was interesting stuff, um, all of it. And I, I, I was fascinated by the instrument as, as well as everything that that comes along with it, you know, and um, and that probably eventually led me to being here. Um, because well, I, I I always stayed fascinated with the gear aspect of all of this stuff. So let me, uh, you know, sort of in keeping with sure. a, a little bit of the chronology that we somehow yep. always end up uh, following because I'm curious and my, my curiosity kind of flows uh, chronologically, uh, whether I do it or not. But, I, but I'm oh, kind yeah, of, that's fine. you know, I'm kind of uh, uh, curious to know something about what you did during the time before you came to Reverend and you and I sure. spoke off uh, line yeah. uh, a little bit about some of the things you did, but I'm interested to know about that and, you know, well, something about accomplishments and maybe some of the lessons you learned along the way by the time you, uh, or before no the time you got to, got to Reverend. So tell me about that. So I, I, I started punker bands in high school and I enjoyed it. Um, after school, I never really had the, bug for continuing education. Um, yeah. a lot of my friends went off to college and I, it's not for I everybody. Literal, <laughs> I literally would woodshedded guitar mm-hmm. instead and bartended and waited tables for years. And I, I got, I, and then I, I started getting out in, in bands. I had this band called the culture man. and it was like a three piece sort of a power trio thing in the Detroit area. And we did this like, musician oriented alternative music kind of a thing. Like we, we were the band that, that was never going to get popular by normal standards, but people in all the other bands came to see us because we had a great drummer and we did weird crap and weird time signatures and a lot of instrumentals and a lot of goofy stuff, you yeah, know? Yeah. And, and it was, it was, it was a very technical band. It was very fun for the early twenties. I look back on it now and I'm like, Oh my God, I can't believe I did that. <laughs> um, but, but it was, it was really interesting, really fun. And, um, I got married very, very young and I, I was, I was recruited into a sales position from a place that I was waiting tables and bartending at. I, um, there was a, a corporate recruiter that used to come in there all the time. And I, 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 I kind of needed a real job. I got married young and, and I, I wanted to pay the rent other than <laughs> waiting tables. Yeah. And so there was this guy who, who, who had a company that was looking for salespeople and college wasn't necessarily a prerequisite. And the job was selling um, automotive paint and sandpaper and products to body shops. Well, that's pretty close and, to what you're doing now, right? 
Right. It is actually. It's funny, <laughs> but I mean, I can relate all of this. Yeah, no. I'm going to tie it all together. I know you are. <laughs> um, <laughs> but so he, uh, I just had a knack for sales. I don't know what it was. I, I, I never would have guessed. And, you know, I tell young people and I've tried to tell my kids, wait tables, do it for a summer, uh, bartend, because you meet, if you do that for any significant amount of time and, and you, you get good at it, People, you, people have to skills, deal, yeah. you have to deal with every kind of personality yeah. and you learn how to deal with somebody based on the first reaction that you get from them or, or the first exchange that you have with them. And that, that's a hard thing. They, they don't teach that in college. Mm-mm. And, Mm-mm. and so I, something about that. And then just the fact that I was this like rock and roll guy walking into body shops, just getting along with the body shop guys. I mean, I don't know. I made it work. And, um, and I, I did, I was very successful. And I, by the, by my late twenties, I was making a lot of money doing it. It was like a commission based thing. Mm -hmm. And I never really, (laughs) I don't know. I, you, if you'd have told me 10 years before that, if you had told me my teenager is teenager, I would end up doing that. You know, I would have been like, no way. But then of course, if you had told me as a teenager that 30 years later, I'd be where I am now. I'd have fallen over dead. Did you have an interest in cars at all at the time or? Uh, I was raised in a car family. I was raised in a General Motors family. My my dad was um, uh, worked for Cadillac, and okay. he was a district mm-hmm. service manager. So I moved around the country as a kid a little bit with him, and then he ended up in publishing at Cadillac, and he collects vintage cars. We have a '65 Eldorado and a '57 Eldorado Brome, and he's the original owner of a '64 Vet. And so, and I used to, I went to swap meets with him and stuff as a little kid. So I had enough car knowledge to be dangerous. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, I mean, um, it almost kind of there almost seems like some synergy there that you ended up, you know, it, in yeah. that field for the time being, you know. And then it was cool because um, I I trained in a couple of different paint lines to spray, to shoot paint <sighs> and to color match and 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 troubleshoot. And, uh, and so I, I know, and, and then I would train painters, you know, oh, on, okay. on, on how to paint cars and use products and things like that. So I have a lot of knowledge sort of in that industry, but after 10 years of it, uh, I, I was kind of burning out and, and I think it was just, and it, it, keep in mind, I played in bands through this entire time, um, and, and did a lot of festivals. I, I, one of the bands I was in used to go to North by Northeast in Toronto all the time when that was a bigger deal. Um, and we used to travel around the Midwest and do, do a lot of, a lot of shows, Cincinnati constantly, uh, well, Chicago constantly. Um, and then of course, cause we're based in the Detroit area. And when you live in Detroit, you're within six hours of a whole bunch of markets yeah, to take sure. your music out to, if you're trying to grow a local music kind of a thing. Were uh, you making any money uh, playing in those days? Oh, hell no. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, not, I thought not, maybe you had a nice what, second what we income doing. or no, no second. Yeah, no, 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 <laughs> no. I, I was, you know, this, a, not, that's not how it worked out, okay. but we, um, well, you did it because you loved. We had a lot it, of right? fun. I got a lot of experience. I played a lot. I enjoyed this. I enjoyed it. Put out records on a on a, a indie label in the Detroit area, and, and really got a kick out of it. Uh, opened for a lot of bands that became things later. You know, and just all a lot of alternative indie bands. You know, when they were touring in vans, and then you know watched that whole scene grow up around me. So it was cool. Um, so when I was doing the paint thing and the sandpaper thing, we would call in some industrial stuff too. So one day in, um, in 1999, I, as I would drive around, cause I was on the road sales and my territory was from like Saginaw, Michigan, halfway up the mitten to Finley, Ohio, down, you know, into the thing. And I, down into the state here a little bit. Um, and I would just, you know, I would call on a whole bunch of body shops and then every once in a while I would stop into music stores and see what they had, see what was coming in on trade. I loved like places, big places used places, guitar center in the nineties when it was so much different than it is now yeah, when there was, sure. there was a lot of used gear culture at guitar center and you could find cool stuff. And even the GCs then had a lot of interesting stuff. And, um, I, so I used to pop into music stores while I was doing the rounds as a, uh, as a paint salesman. And, um, 
one of these days, one, one day I ended up at a musical roundup in Novi, Michigan, and they were selling a Reverend Commando used. And it said East Point, Michigan, right on the headstock. And I went, well, where, where's that? You know, what, what's, what's this? Like, I, I had no idea. The company was about two years old. And so get this. I looked it up in the phone book. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Remember that? I, I don't. Um, I almost that's, don't. <laughs> that's what we used to do. When I used to, you know, when I used to cold call on, on body shops and stuff in, in little towns, I would go into town. I would find a restaurant. I would go to the phone book. I would look up body shops. I would write all the stuff down or, or tear the pages out <laughs> and, uh, and you can go out and, you know, and, and do the thing. So I looked him up and just knocked on his door one day and said, Hey, you make guitars here. I, I'm, I'm interested. I sell sandpaper. I bet you use sandpaper. He used sandpaper. Uh, and Joe, so Joe Naylor actually became a customer of mine and, oh, that's interesting. you know, I ordered, I ordered sandpaper for all of his machines and the hand file paper and stuff that they used because the original Reverend guitars, um, he had the, the necks and the pickups were manufactured by others to his specifications. Mm -hmm. And those others went through a few different incarnations and then ended up being mere music in Korea, made the necks and made the pickups for Joe. Um, and then Joe made the bodies and the bodies were a, a six inch wide block of Karina with a mold injected one piece plastic outer body ring and the tops and the backs were like a phenolic material. Um, so there was no real paint involved in it, but of course he had to sand down all the edges of the phenolics and they had, you know, they, they, they did a lot of sanding work actually making these things. Um, and so, um, I, I sort of got that account and then of course, I mean, his first order, he probably bought a year's worth of stuff from me, but I still went there every two weeks. <laughs> of course. Of course. <laughs> I still put him on my regular sales route yeah, because yeah. it was the coolest thing I did. Yeah. You know, by far. It was just it. awesome to go in there. And I ended up like buying a ton of his guitars because I just, I loved them. Uh, the local music store, Joe's Music in East Point, Michigan, still there, still one of our biggest dealers. Uh, they have 60 reverends hanging on the wall as we speak. Um, he and I, 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 different Joe, by the way, not Joe Naylor, mm -hmm. that's Joe Pistorius. Um, I eventually after buying a few guitars and stuff and, and, and hanging out there so much, Joe asked me if I would like to go to the NAMM show with him as a guest because he knew how into gear I was. And I was like, what's that? Oh. <laughs> because I played in bands and, and I mean, I went around to music stores and stuff, but I never read a trade magazine. You know what I mean? I read vintage guitar and I guess I would see Nam coverage in it, but it never really clicked yeah. with me what that really was. And when was that? And when was that, Ken? This would remember? have been in the summer of 1999. Okay. All right. And, uh, so, and that was when the Nashville show was still a huge, huge show. You know, it wasn't too far from when they, they split the show up from the one big show in Chicago to the show in California and the show in Nashville. And the show in Nashville they had a very large presence for a long time. It outgrew the original convention center in Nashville eventually, which is why they moved it to begin with. Yeah. Um, and eventually they built a new convention center and ended up moving it back. And I think that that summer NAM show is sort of a, a shadow of its former self. That's but what it's I hear. still enjoyable. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, we go every year. I'm a big supporter of NAM. And, um, and we always have great shows down there. So, so at any rate, I drove down there or flew down there, I think with, uh, the bass player in a band I was in at the time called the kids from Krypton. <laughs> and, uh, he and I went down there and I walked in the door and at the old Nashville convention center, they used to have, were you ever at that show? Uh, I, 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 I don't know. I mean, I don't think so. But I used to, I spent many of those years, those years I was really in middle of my career, I was in medical media. So I did, I did go there for some medical shows that I was involved in. I don't think I went to uh, NAM. So I didn't really come back to this in a big way until around 2005 or six or so. So Well, they had, they had uh, a couple of different rooms. They had sort of the, the main convention hall, and there was a smaller hall upstairs with some private rooms. And from some windows in the private rooms, you could look down onto the main floor. And I remember walking in there, walking in on the second floor like you did and poking around and seeing the windows and sort of walking over and looking down onto the main floor of the NAMM show. And I just, I, right away, I knew that I was doing the wrong thing with my life. <laughs> just in, in that like lightning bolt. And it sounds like a weird cliche, but I mean, I... I stood there and went like, 
wait, this is a thing. You know, it, it, it just never even occurred to me that there, there was a way that these things were marketed and the way these, the, the, this industry worked. And, and so, and not unlike sitting there with this guitar on the floor, I, I, then it sort of became my mission to figure out how all this stuff worked. So coincidentally, while I'm there, I, I met this guy named um, Bob McNally. He made these little strumstick things. He made the backpacker for Martin. And he had this girl working for him that I became friends with. And I was talking to them in their booth. And Will Ray came in and bought from the Helicasters. He yeah. came in and bought one of one of his products. And I, I was standing there like, that's Will Ray. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, whoa, I love this guy. I love this guy. Like, wow. And, and, and then he's like, you know, he looks at me. I'm standing there with this girl. He looks at me. He's like, well, uh, hello there. So, Ken, Ken, who are you with? Oh, Reverend Guitars. Well, I've never heard about that. Tell me about that. And he sticks his hand out. And I'm like, uh, mm, uh, uh. <laughs> and, uh, and then I'm like, well, cool, man. Check it out. There are these really cool guitars. Like, uh, they're developed by this guy named Joe Naylor, and they have this sort of a non traditional body construction. I explained to him the body construction that I explained to you a couple minutes ago, and blah, blah, blah. And he was like, that sounds real interesting. I'm going to go down there and look at that. And then about 45 minutes later, I'm walking by Joe's booth, and Will Ray is writing Joe a check. <laughs> How about that? And, and that was your I first sale. Over, and Will is like, <laughs> Will's like, well, now that's Ken right there. That's that's the guy that was telling me about y'all. He's a real nice guy, and uh, and and Will leaves, and Joe's like, dude, <laughs> and I'm like, uh, he's like, how'd you do that? I'm like, I don't really know. Um, and Joe said to me, well, I'm going to bring you to every one of these if you can do that. You go meet people and bring them to the booth. Have fun. See you later. So that was your demo and job so, or something like that. I mean, so yeah, I started going to NAMM shows with Joe and trying to get people to come talk to him. Um, and he, Joe is, uh, he's a hell of a designer and, but one of, one of the things that Reverend never really had was outgoing sales for a number of years. Um, he created these really cool products and he got a, a lot of word of mouth from artists and he picked up b good artists like Rick Vito and Billy Corgan and all, all of the, these things started happening for Joe with the original guitars. And then the original guitar sales started to sort of falter. There were a lot of fits and starts with that original design because guitar players, they're just weird. It's a thing. It's a thing we all share. Mm -hmm. um, there are certain guys that will look at an innovative product and be like, well, that's really cool. I have to have it. And then there are certain guys that'll look at that thing and go, well, that doesn't have a flame maple top. I don't understand <laughs> it. I just don't understand what that is or what yeah. that does. <laughs> and, and the guys who understood the original Reverend guitar loved it and still do. Uh, they're out there. They're all being played. But we got to a point where they just started to sort of slow down for Joe. So while this was happening, while Joe was doing this and I was just going to trade shows, I had an opportunity present itself to me, which was ridiculous. Um, but to, to get into a small automotive business of my own, um, with a gentleman that, that I knew who was a really good car salesman who made me an offer to start a business with him where I would go to the auctions and buy clean cars. And I knew clean cars from my experience in the body shop industry. Um, I would provide the, the, rolling stock and he would sell it. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, we did some retail business and some wholesale business and we did it for a few years. This was in the early two thousands. I got out of the body shops, which was good, which I needed to do. And then I sort of ran when, when we started this business, I got, um, you know, QuickBooks and I taught myself how to do small business accounting mm -hmm. as this car business was rolling on. Um, I learned how to do these things and, I very quickly discovered that I didn't like the car business either, that end of it. I thought it would be better. I thought being my own boss would be cool. Um, money was okay, but people just don't you – know, the fact that I would go out and buy all these clean cars and stuff didn't translate to the general public. They didn't – they just think anybody that's but, but you had already had a cars. You'd already had a taste of this. You'd already had a taste of this stuff mm -hmm. at NAM and – wasn't that I really just, where your heart I, was at? Oh, it sure was. You know? I just didn't know how to get into it. Right, right. I didn't know how to make it happen. Right. You know, and, and Reverend never grew to the point where Joe wanted to hire me with those original guitars. Right. 
um, or I couldn't convince Joe that it was a good idea to hire me or whatever, whatever it was, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Sure. Um, it just didn't click. And of course I had to make a living. Uh, and, and, and I was still playing in bands and doing all this stuff as well. And, and, um, so around 2000, I'm, I'm to now I'm tying the history of the company with my own history. I hope you don't mind. Uh, but in around 2004, Joe had some ideas for some guitars that were more traditional designs, mm-hmm. solid wood designs. Sure. And he went to Mir, the, the the factory that was making the body, the necks and the pickups. I mean, and he had some prototypes made. And he and I were talking on the phone. We talked on the phone a lot, and we saw each other. Like I said, we saw each other at shows, and I still went to all the NAMs and. And I would go to the Dallas show with him and, and do different Arlington. I, I really enjoyed that one. And he started telling me that he was having these prototypes done. And he wanted to send one to me. And my initial reaction was, I can't believe you got to build a guitar in Korea and put the Reverend name on it, you know, because I'm a guitar player and it's what we do. Mm-hmm. Right. And the funny thing about that is, is that I, you know, I've been as a stone, one of my favorite brands. So I don't know why I had this you know, initial reaction to it. But I mean, I'm not going to lie to people about it. Originally I was like, Oh dude, yeah, you don't need yeah. to do that. You yeah. know, but here's the thing. Businesses have to evolve and they, they have to make money. They don't exist anymore. <laughs> right. This is a, this is a thing, you know, and, and I love it when people say to me, well, you should make the old guitars or I can't believe you stopped making the old guitars and what, or whatever. And we used to get a lot more of that than we do now, of course, but, but it was always like, yeah, okay. But you don't understand there, there's a reason why that happened. There's a reason why it had to happen. And Joe needed to do something. He needed to try something. He needed to like keep it moving. And, um, so we got in, so he made some prototypes, one of which I'm looking at right now. Oh. One of the original two guitars that came from Mirrors hanging in my office. That's a Warhawk humbuckers. And Joe sent me a Warhawk with P90s, which I also have. And he said, here, man, take this thing out on a gig. And I got it. And I looked at it and it was really cool looking. <laughs> and I took it out on a gig and it crushed. I mean, the neck was the same. The pickups were the same. And in a solid body platform, the guitar just sounded better for rock than the old semi-hollow phenolic top and backed ones did. It was all right there. I mean, it just, I strummed a chord and was like, oh no, <laughs> you know, cause you're like, oh, there's this thing that I've believed in wholeheartedly for the last five years. And then he just blew it out of the water with this thing, you know, like, oh, wow. Um, so I got pretty excited about it. And the price point was right, you know? Um, I mean, at the time, the stuff was six, $700. Sure. You know, yeah. we could sell it retail. Mm-hmm. Can't, of course, money has changed a lot in the last 15 years, and now they're more like nine to $1,500. Right. But, so he started offering both lines concurrently for a little while. And then about three months went by, and he never took an order for one of the original design guitars. And so the writing was on the wall and there were a couple other manufacturing things that put the writing on the wall, but basically the, his focus and the way he did business sort of fundamentally changed instead of bringing in a bunch of parts and making guitars, all of a sudden he was bringing in guitars and setting them up. Um, and so armed with this new line with a handful of new models, we went into the NAMM show in January of 2006. Maybe it was 2007, but I think it was 2006. (laughs) And I just decided to get out of the car business. Um, I I had had, (laughs) well, I had had three years, you know, I had 12 years doing the body shop thing and a few years into my own foray and I wasn't making any money. Um, and I just needed to be done. And then I'm thankful that I did because she's a couple years later, um, we did that weird used car buyback thing on the federal government level here. And that just destroyed that industry for, for a few years. And, uh, so I got out of it in, in, in a really good time. Sounds like And, it. um, I had a job offer at, at an auction down here that I didn't really want to take, but, um, I needed to work, you know? And, uh, so I pushed back the start of that job to February 1st, and this was in December. And I called Mr. Naylor and said, hey, man, NAMP's coming up. You have all these new guitars, and I want the opportunity to sell them. And what I'd like to do is work for you for the month of January for four guitars, me a guitar a week. I wanted one of each of the new models real bad. 
and uh, and I will come work for you, and I'll go to the NAMM show, and I'll well, I'll come up January second. I'll start, and I will make some phone calls, and I'll make some appointments. Give me a list of dealers that you wish you had. Um, give me any prospects that you have, people you want me to talk to. I'll call and make appointments. Go to the show with you. Uh, do the appointments. Try to take some orders. Get some stuff happening, and then um, and then I'll even follow up for a week after the show's over. And I went to the NAM show and sold 475 guitars. Wow. Wow. That's and, <laughs> and, and, and then Naylor, and now in all fairness, 174 of them went to one dealer in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> now, d- d- but, what, still, your, but your deal was, was to get guitars and your compensation was guitars or did that con- convert to something else at that point? No, it was my competition was yeah. guitars. So then after the show was over, and we had sold all these products, and I didn't do it alone. Joe did it with me. I mean, we right. did it, you know. Um, we Joe said, you know, all these people are going to be calling looking for you. And I was like, ah, no. <laughs> He's like, well, I guess I need to offer you a job. And I was like, you do. <laughs> and so I came on as his sales director, finally, uh-huh. after uh-huh. years of dabbling in it, yeah. you know. And, uh, and then I just went for it. And we had our first million dollar year in 2007, which is funny because you look at like, you know, these hundred, the, the two big hundred million dollar companies in this business. And you look at, you know, the, the, the $60 million companies in this business and the $30 million companies in this business. And you're like, Oh, it, well, those guys are huge or whatever. Yet they're huge. The rest of us are, are not that, you know, um, sure. And so a million dollars is quite a milestone for any small business, of course, as the small business people will tell you. Yep. Um, but it was very exciting. And, uh, <clears throat> and and then we started gathering artists. Pete Anderson came on board. Yeah, we already had Rick Vito, but we were, st- we were we, you know, he was getting more involved uh, with things. And then Reeves Cabrels got involved. Mm-hmm. Uh, I love, I mean, the Reeves. Reeves got a guitar from us at Summer Nam and called like a month later and just told me he couldn't put it down. And if, if we were interested in working with him officially, he would be interested. And of course, Joe jumped at the yeah. chance. It's Reeves Cabral, he's a legend. <laughs> yeah. And so we started getting these really good artists and it was it a was very exciting time, you know. And then we had that economic downturn thing in 2008. Sure, you were and teed up for that. Wow. wow. All of MI just went in the toilet. Yeah. It was brutal. I mean, we, I was in, we, I was back in it at that time. And I remember, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But about 30% of the guitar stores just closed. Yeah. People just were going out of business left and right. Um, and some of the larger companies really have never recovered to the levels that they were at before that, at least in real unit sales of electric guitars. You know what I mean? They've sure. made up for it in other ways, but it, it, yeah. it was, it was a really odd, difficult time because so much of of MI is made up of of people's expendable income that we weren't, uh, you know, that we just lost a lot of it. Um, and we we were in a, in a cool kind of position. We were able to stay afloat, I think, because we offer a very unique, high quality product in the price range that we're in. And and so I think guys who are spending a lot of money on high end guitars who still wanted to buy guitars were buying some of our stuff. Um, but fewer people were stepping up into the next level of guitars at the time. Yeah. So our, our growth really stagnated, of course, and, and, and we had a hard time with it. And um, Joe, I just got tired of the ups and downs. Like, we finally had this thing going. And then he didn't do anything wrong. You know, it just, it just the business climate just took, took a huge downfall. And so um, Joe started looking to sell the company uh, and my wife, Penny, and I were just, I, I was finally doing what I wanted to do with my life. Yeah, and I finally I had, imagine. And you're thinking, I finally now, had this thing. Like, and I, yeah, I'm, I mean, I was like staring down the nose of being 40, you know, and I'm like, ah, now what? You know, I mean, I clearly... Yes, I, 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 at the, and at the time, I was in a, a regionally successful band that I still perform in. I'm not going to go off on this. I'm not going to go off on a tangent about that, but I play in this really goofball band called the Polka Floyd Show. Oh, I've heard and of it that. Is a, yeah. yeah, you Maybe have. Maybe because I've read it in your bio. <laughs> That's hilarious. 
<laughs> it's fun. We travel. Uh, we get paid well. I'm, uh, it's fun. We travel. We get paid well. I was doing that. Um, and as I, as I was no longer full time at Reverend, you know, I, I would be down to, you know, you got moved down to three days a week or whatever. Um, really, the Polka Floyd show was contributing to my income. We sold a lot of recorded music for a little while. We licensed stuff. We did a lot of Oktoberfests and a lot of different things. And I had that sort of going. That was kind of fun. But, you know, Reverend was like my heart, you know, and I just like, I, I, I just couldn't believe that, I don't know, I was going to lose it, I guess. And so um, a, a couple different companies sort of looked at us and, and I don't think we were big enough. I mean, I don't know what the, the deal with all of that was. And, and finally I, I, I sat down with, with my wife and we came up with an offer for Joe and that offer included lifetime employment if he wanted us. And, and if he wanted it, because he just wanted to design guitars, you know, running the business can be very running, running a small business and doing all this payroll and doing all this taxes and all this government crap. And it's just, it's, insane. it's a lot. It's even, it, and, it, it's and not then, getting better. <laughs> see, I couldn't do all the things that I do and design guitars. And I think Joe was tired of designing guitars and having to do all those other things. Right. Sure. understandable. And, and Joe is a brilliant designer. I mean, if if you look at our product line, and I'm not just blowing smoke. I mean, this is the thing. I, I people in this industry often say, "Well, you know, we have uh, their unique designs, but they're vintage inspired and with their own, you know, blah blah blah." Yeah, yeah. Same and it's it's they people say that so much that it's like a cliche, right? Yeah. We actually do that. <laughs> yeah. Like our stuff looks like our stuff. People look at our stuff and go, oh, "Yeah, that's a reverend." Sure. But yet it still kind of has the feel of the great brands of the fifties and sixties and those great guitars. But we, we have this like, you know, quality thing and this reputation that, that we've earned and we, we have all these things. And I just couldn't stand the thought is some of the companies that looked at it, looked at us were like, Joe, you're going to design guitars and, and can you, you have the dealer contacts and, and you guys both know the artists. So you, neither of you are going anywhere. We're going to bring you on board. But the reality of that is a year later, you're done. You know what I mean? Sure. I, I, yeah. You know, CBS got rid of Leo for crying out loud. Yeah. It, it's the way it works, right? And I just couldn't stand the thought of it. So, so Penny and I made Joe this offer, and he accepted it, ah. which surprised me, <laughs> <laughs> frankly. Um, but, but I think Joe still wanted to make guitars. You know, and he and and this was his dream, and this whole brand, everything we do is his legacy. It's his thing, and and. Um, so Joe and I are in a very unique situ- situation as far as human relationships are concerned, where we were friends for years before I went to work for him. And me working for him didn't ruin that friendship, and him working for me doesn't ruin that friendship. We, yeah. the, we have a mutual respect for each other, and we know what our strengths are, and we try to work on those strengths, right, um, to make this thing work. And um, and we the, the initial idea when when I bought the company, when I started this company, whatever, however you want to look at it, depending on how, whether you want to look and at that it was about or however you want to look at it, whatever. What year was that? 2010. January of 2010. Yeah, okay. That sounds about right. Five, five weeks after I turned 40. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, we, uh, the idea was to see how small we could be and still survive. How few guitars can we make and still keep the doors open and pay the rent and pay our key employee? We, there's a setup guy here, Zach Green, who has been with the company for 20 years, 21 years. And he built the old guitars. He set up all of the new ones. He currently does uh, Sustaniac installations and uh, the Fishman Greg Cock pickup um, installations for the Gristlemaster guitar we do, yep. uh, as well as still doing setups and special things here. Um, he's a great guy and, and very valuable employee to us. His initials are on the back of most of the headstocks. Um, so we just started fresh and we weren't really advertising. We weren't really doing anything in 2010. We were selling, you know, 150 to 200 guitars a month. We were lucky 125 to 150 really at the start and, uh, and, and to our sort of established dealer network. And then, we grew it out from there. And you um, had, you had dealers and, that, and, uh, that, that were loyal to you that stuck, stuck with you. Absolutely. You know, all of them did. Yeah. yeah. That's a big deal. 
Yeah. Um, well, they, you know, a lot of them, you know, I brought on, on board. So a, a lot of them were easy, but a lot of them, um, were dealers that, you know, Joe, Joe had been cultivating for years that loved the product. True Tone out in Santa Monica, mm -hmm. uh, under the ownership of Ken Daniels, Ken and Joe Naylor got along very, very well. Mm -hmm. Um, and they were our number one dealer for a number of years. And, uh, and then of course, you know, Joe's music in East Point, Michigan, um, you know, stuck with us, Durdell's music here in Toledo, Ohio. Uh, there were people that believed in us that hung it out. And since then we've grown it into, you know, I think we did two and a half million dollars worth of sales last year. We have some ungodly 60, 62 different skews or something. <laughs> We've got guitars everywhere. Well, well that, you know, uh, that kind of gets me to a point where I want to, I wanted to try to, uh, focus in on a few, uh, things yeah, fire that, away, that, that are of interest to me. And one of them, and sure. they're going to be maybe kind of random because we're at that point yeah, now where we're sort of, you know, in, in the current events, uh, mode. But one of the things that when we talked the other day and I've seen, uh, in, uh, some of the stuff that you guys put out there, that uh, you know, you're you're proud to announce that uh, the guitars are are built in in South Korea, and that you mention the factory's name. You mentioned the the mere name, and mm -hmm. I I really I don't know that I've seen somebody do that, uh, and maybe that they are, and I I, don't, I haven't paid attention to it, but I'm certainly familiar with the factory, and and they do produce some really great product, but you've, uh, you know, kind of gone out there and said, uh, you know, this is, uh, this is what we make and this is where we make them and this is who's making them. And how does that, how does that work for you? And are there any logistical issues, uh, that, um, are worth, uh, uh, bringing to light in terms of managing that kind of manufacturing, uh, you know, in terms of pluses and minuses? So that's a big question. There's a lot of elements to it. So I'm going to give that to you and then you yeah, can kind of no, take it where you want to go. It's interesting. Um, Joe, Joe developed that relationship initially. Um, the gentlemen that run the mirror factory are also NAM members and they attend the show every January. Mm -hmm. um, I have never been to Korea. Joe's never been to Korea. We meet with them once a year here. Uh, they're really cool guys. Um, the, the gentleman who's in charge over there, uh, Mr. Cho is a third generation instrument maker. It was his grandfather's factory. Um, he tells this great story about how, when he was a young man, um, you know, obviously the, uh, American military presence has been strong there. Uh, my grandfather, Dwight Bingham was a full Colonel boots on the ground during the Korean conflict. Mm -hmm. And so if somebody really comes down hard on me about the Korean thing, I just, I love to bring that up because my grandfather fought in Korea for me to have my guitars built there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, uh, and Mr. Cho said, tells this story about how he saw the Beatles on Ed Sullivan on armed forces television as a young man and went running to his dad and his grandpa telling them that they needed to start building electric guitars. And it is such a funny story. I have no idea whether or not it's true, but it is a great story. <laughs> wow. It's a good sales pitch. Uh -huh. um, but in, in, they built for a handful of brands, smaller brands. Uh, it's not a, uh, you know, it's significantly smaller than a world music and not, not even in the same realm of some of the stuff that was made in Korea 20, 30 years ago, your Samix and your courts and things like that. It's a completely different kind of manufacturing. Which is why those giant factories don't exist in Korea anymore, because there's no place for them in that um, in that economy. So they, they've moved on to wherever they are, Indonesia or China or whatever. Yeah. And so there's a couple of unique um, aspects to Korean manufacturing. Um, it's not unlike Japanese manufacturing where they, they just have absolute they, tons of pride in their work. And um, the people that work in the factory, the average age of their employee is over 55. And they, they also have a very difficult time finding youth to work in manufacturing there because their youth have grown up like our youth have with computers and, and yeah. iPhones. Yeah. And, and those are the kind of jobs that they're looking for. Um, so he's actually in, in a somewhat very uh, American position, <laughs> as it were. Sounds like um, it. But they, um, they're, uh, we don't need to have like inspectors 
there or anything like that like you hear with other Asian manufacturing because it's it's very much like a Japanese thing. Um, they're very serious, you know, and uh, anywhere like the the uh, American guitar thing um, doesn't really exist outside of America. You know, it's it's a uniquely American perspective. Um, and I'm, I'm all, well, listen, we're an American company, you know, and I'm proud to be an American mm-hmm. company. There's no question. Um, and this is where we exist and pay taxes and, and, and do all that stuff. And I export from here in Toledo. I sell guitars all over the world and all over the world. South Korea is respected as an industrial manufacturing leader. Yeah, that's true. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I'm not, I, I just don't, to me, I'm just sort of taking advantage of their reputation yeah. when I mention it in my marketing and stuff, because they do, they do it right. I mean, the guitars speak for themselves. Um, and then what, what I like to say we do here in Toledo is then we, we, we take the commodity and we turn it into an instrument here. Um, all guitars are, are, are the sum of their parts, correct? Sure. And um, I think what what we see in a lot of manufacturing in this business is people take really super high quality parts and they slap them all together and put them in a box and send them to a dealer. And it's up to the dealer to sort of set them up and get them on the wall. Well, a lot of large dealers don't do that. It's the way it is. Um, So we import the guitars from Korea to our shop here in Toledo. And I have uh, five, soon to be six guys that work in the back here. Um, inspecting and setting up guitars. So, uh, and real setups, intonation, action. Um, if there's any fret work that needs to be done, we do fret levels here. Uh, I refer to Zach Green as the human pluck machine all the time because I have dealers that have pluck machines to put our guitars in them and they only get the most minor of adjustments. How much time uh, do you have to put into uh, to a guitar it, to get it ready? It depends. I mean, uh, uh, you know, uh, tunematic style, hardtail bridge, we can do a full, you know, if it's just smooth, we can do everything we need to do on it in 20 or 25 minutes. Okay. Uh, when it comes to floating trims and big speeds and things, there's other adjustments that need to be made. And then of course, in the occasion where there is a, if there is a fret thing or whatever, or sometimes, you know, we get fret sprout here in the winter time too. It's wood, it's physics. Right. You know, we can't defy physics no matter the, how high the quality of the thing is. Maple moves in the winter time. It just does. Mm-hmm. Um, I've got a $3,500 sir here in my office that I had to take the fret ends down the first winter I had it in Ohio. Mm-hmm. You know, it is what it is. Um, but I, I purposely under moisturize our warehouse so that if we do get fret sprout, I like to fix it here before it goes to the dealers because I don't because I want, my goal is not on, I mean, it's just, it's the Ibanez playbook from 1978. Look, everybody, everybody just automatically trusts that Fender and Gibson are going to be awesome. So when they're hanging up on the wall in a guitar store and the Reverend is hanging up next to it, the Reverend's got to play better. I want I want the guy to get down my competitor's guitars and play them and then get down my guitar and have it be like night and day. And it's and a great strategy. I think, I think we pull it off. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that that's why we do what we do here, because then we know, you know, we know when they go that they're right. And sometimes there's there's things we do. Uh, we do a lot of satin finishes and sometimes there'll be a little you know, a, a tiny piece of fiber, a little piece of dust or something in a satin finish. And there's nothing we can do about it. You can't sand it out, you know, because you'll gloss and shine up an area, you know, like <laughs> yeah. that or whatever, you know, and yeah. I understand that. I mean, there are limitations to some of the things that we can think, but some of that stuff is okay. I mean, I think it, you know, at nine ninety nine or ten ninety nine on a guitar, that's got a Karina body and a roasted maple neck and custom electronics and all that kind of stuff. There's a little speck of dust in the clear on the back. I can live with it. You know, so sometimes there's little minor things and I have to make a judgment call and I make it. But for the most part, the guitars are just, they're exceptional. So the satin they all play the, exceptionally well. The satin finish seems to be a, a bit of a trend. And... Yeah, it's cool. I, you know, uh, it, it came about with us with Pete Anderson um, because Pete Anderson wanted new guitars, but he wanted nickel hardware and satin finishes because he wanted the guitars to develop a patina very quickly. 
And the satin finish, when you play it, I mean, if you play a guitar regularly for a year, you start to rub the areas that your fingers come in contact with the most start to shine up. Mm. You know what I mean? And, it, mm-hmm. and, and of course, nickel, you've got to be super diligent with, with polish in order to keep it looking like chrome or else it very quickly starts to, you know, change color and develop a patina and stuff. And so, you know, Pete's guitars after continual use for years start to look old and cool and this thing that Pete likes without actually relicking, you know what I mean? It's sort of like a do it yourself relic kit, right? Yeah. Um, it's that this kind of neat. And then other artists that we worked with liked the look and Naylor liked the look. And so Naylor started offering it on certain production models and certain things. And, and yeah, man, it's, it's I, super cool. I just, I mean, you the, brought it up and I just, uh, yeah. I, I, I've seen just in the last few days, a couple of, uh, uh, manufacturers, uh, that I know fairly well, just introducing new models with satin finishes. And, uh, you know, then, I mean, when I was at NAMM, I saw D'Angelico with a million, <laughs> a million different colors of satin finishes on these arch tops or whatever they were, laminates. Uh, so it kind of said, well, that must be happening. That must be a thing, you know, and, uh, it feels cool. <laughs> let me, um, uh, go ahead. You, well, I was just going to, uh, kind of move on to something that sure. logically, uh, follows that and uh, talk a little bit about, uh, competitiveness of the business and, you know, kind of w- wanted to ask you a little bit about what you do to differentiate Reverend in the market, you know, what works and what has not worked, you know, I'm still figuring that out. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you may, um, it may be a, doing that it constantly. Is a constant yeah. learning process. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we, you know, we try to do our own thing. Joe tries to do his own thing. Um, we do do, you know, a, a very, um, a very telly style, T style type model in the, uh, Reverend Pete Anderson, East, style, uh, East Sider models. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was very much at the request of Pete and Joe Naylor really didn't want to do it. Joe oh. was like, dude, we make all these cool guitars. Why on earth would we want to make a telly? Yeah. And I was like, well, cause Pete wants one and Pete's become a really close friend of the company and and originally he was going to do those signature models sort of on our charger body platform and then the more he thought about it he was just super associated with with his 59 esquire when he was playing with dwight yoakam and then of course his tom anderson guitars and he just wanted to sort of follow suit but so when joe decided to pick up on that model um, then Joe decided, well, he's going to make, you know, like the best one. <laughs> sure. And, and so we use this, we use a Karina body and we use custom wound pickups that are wound to sound old, you know, old like Anico magnet style pickups. And, and it's chambered strategically around the neck joint to, so that they're all very, very resonant, but yet it's completely solid around the bridge so that it still has that, uh, T style punch and sustain. And I guess why well, Joe carries that across the line. See, here's, I, I say this about our company all the time, but one of the things that, that sets us apart from our main competition, I feel, is that we're not weighted down by our own legacy. When we do something, people don't look at it and go, oh, that's stupid. How could they do that? How could they do that to that guitar? Oh, I can't believe that. Oh, the, you know, the you, uh, robot tuners or 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 the Meteora or whatever it is, you know, people look at new products from the big companies and they're, they're horrified, you know, and even Smith, Smith has been around for 40 years and he gets that when he does stuff that's outside of the custom 24 or whatever his big models are. Um, we don't have that issue. So Joe can innovate. And when we do a model, there's a couple of different, a couple of different things to talk about here. So when it comes to the signature models, we manufacture and market the exact model that that artist is playing. There's no, well, we, we, we're, we're in a little room in the back and we make this special one for Billy Corgan, but, but this is what we're going to send to the people. You know what I mean? Right. It's not that. I mean, we, we, we take this thing very, very seriously. And if the Smashing Pumpkins are out on tour somewhere and Billy gets all of his guitars stolen, he can call us. We can overnight him a couple of guitars. He can walk to the stage with them. And, it's that. And it's, it's going to be familiar and it should, it should play the yeah, way he the same guitar. It to, yeah. Right. yeah. We even set them up the way the artists like them. That's how ridiculous we've gotten. Well, that makes sense. We, use, I mean, we, 
we use hybrid strings on all the Reeves Gabrels models, the nine through 46, the top three from, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a nine set and the bottom three from a 10 set because that's what Reeves plays. And we want the guitars to, this is what Reeves likes. Here it is. It, same with the, the pickups and, and the whole nine yards. So there's that sort of aspect of it. And it then, sort of seems to me like that's the way a signature guitar ought to be made. I agree. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. Um, and, and that, you know, that comes with its own, like, now I'm currently working with Fishman because of the great cock thing. So that, that sort of thing has opened up doors for us too, to, to co-market stuff mm -hmm. with people, which is awesome, right? It's what you want. Yeah. And then, um, and then Joe, he doesn't just do anything for the sake of doing it. So, uh, Joe plays in a two man band, Joe Naylor. Um, and they, I think he, I think he's currently tuning down to B or C or something. Um, he plays baritone guitar and, or down tuned guitar at any rate. And he wanted to make a proper baritone, but he wanted it to play like a guitar. So instead of just like slapping a longer neck on something we already do, he designed our descent baritone from the ground up and it's a 26 and three quarter scale. He moved the bridge back further into the body so that when you sit and play it, you don't feel like you're reaching your arm out into the ethos right. in order to, to chord that C chord. Um, and then came up with a custom gauge of strings, uh, with a playing 26 on the, in the D position, which is the third string on that mm -hmm. guitar. Um, so that when you're playing leads, it feels like a guitar and not like a baritone. You just happen to be tuned down. Um, he designed the 12 string model from the ground up. We, I mean, we do a 12 string with the, in, again, instead of just sort of converting something, he's like, no, what, what's wrong with all the conventional 12 strings on the market? I'm going to fix it. And we play a bunch of different, he plays a bunch of different guitars and we come out with this 12 string. that has got a, uh, one and three quarter inch at the nuts. So you can finger complicated chords in the first position. Uh, even if you have big old yam hands like I do. And, uh, and then uh, a spruce top on a Karina body. So you get this sort of jangle thing. Uh, he extended the upper horn really far. So you don't get a, a lot of neck dive with it because we put 12 locking tuners on it and found this really cool Godo bridge that you can intonate all the strings. So not only can you get it to be in tune, but then it'll stay in tune. And it, it is one of our most popular products. Um, we sell a lot of baritones and a lot of 12 strings and I, I'm proud of that. I think it's cool because I think even your guys with, um, who are really, really married, you've got your like fender guy. It may not play strat. That's what I play. And that's it. You yeah. know, it's like, yeah. okay, I get it. And I'm, I'm never going to get that guy as a, as a, as a full on customer, but that guy want, wants a 12 string or a baritone or something. Well, you get him in the door and one way or another, you know, if they like yeah. what you're doing with the 12 string, uh, maybe they say, well, maybe I'm going to try the, uh, this one or that one, you know? And basses too. Uh, we're, we, we do a signature bass for Mike Watt, who in my mind is just an absolute legend. And, and what, um, you know, we worked on that base for five years of back and forth. Wow. Um, I, I have the prototypes made in Korea. Be, people are always like, Oh, do you do all the prototyping yourself? Well, no, because what's the point of that? <laughs> yeah, if, exactly. If, if they're going to be playing the actual instrument, then you're that we're manufacturing, then mirror needs to make the prototypes, right? That's it, correct. Their work I mean, needs to be approved obvious, by yeah. the artist. Yeah. Um, and, and it's really not that difficult. I mean, this is, it's, it's a, it's a global economy, right? And, and it, I mean, it's a funny thing to say, you know, I don't want to be all like, you know, Bush senior about it, all new world order about it or anything like that. But, but I mean, it is what we do. And I sell a lot of guitars into the UK and into Australia and I sell a lot of guitars right back to Asia and where the things are made means less and less. And people, you know, forties and under it, it's not on the radar like it is with the baby boomer generation, you know? And yes, every month I send some money to Korea for inventory. And then every month people send me money from the UK and from Russia and from Japan and from Korea and from wherever, you know, Finland and Norway and all the places that we sell guitars all around the world. That currency comes flowing into the U S from us doing this. Yeah. And we use that currency to pay our employees and pay our taxes and support our families and children and, and, and to be a part of this thing. Um, and at and the end so of the month, then QuickBooks tells you whether or not you made a profit, right? Right. Yeah. Yes. It sure does. <laughs> it sure does. Um, and, 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 you know, and it's fun and it's supposed to be fun. 
Absolutely. And you got to love it. I love working with my artists and I like going to guitar shows. We just got back from Dallas. We talked about that on the phone. I love going to that Dallas show. I judge a youth guitar competition down there. Like who the hell am I to judge? But, but I do it for the kid, for the kids and, and all of that stuff. And I like going out and doing clinics with Greg and I like watching people get excited over Greg playing and that's and not i difficult love the fact to do. that i'm a part of that <laughs> yeah. no i know he's yeah. ex- he's it's so much fun guy. to be a part yeah. of 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 all of that you know and it's fun to like it's fun to you know i it just have it all together i you know i, I i've got a fun story that i like to close with yeah so you let me know when you're ready <laughs> yeah, I, I, I had a couple more quick sure, ones, and we're you know we're we're getting to that time. But I, I wanted to kind of, I wanted to combine a couple of questions that I had written down, sure. and I, I think I'm I'm just going to ask you. I wanted to ask you what kind of a CEO you think you are, and I had another question on company culture. So I think I'm going to combine those two things and and ask you what kind of a CEO are you, and you know, how, how does that affect your company culture and, and how does that affect the operations of the business? I, I may have mentioned earlier that I'm crazy about guitars and I think some yeah. of the guys that work for me think I'm nuts because yeah. um, <laughs> guitars come and go. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I like to see what other people are doing and, and I like to play out. So I'm, I tend to be very busy as this company grew we're, we're right smack in the middle of the Rust Belt, you know, uh, here in Toledo. And, you, you know, it took a long time. This area was the last area to bounce back after that big downturn we had in 2008, right? Yeah. So as we started to put, as we started to grow, um, one of the first people we hired was the bass player in one of my bands who was working for a medical warehouse for, he played bass for 25 years. Uh, but his, his day job was, was working for a med- uh, medical supply warehouse and they upped and moved their business to Chicago from Toledo and they offered him a dollar an hour raise to move to Chicago. From oh, Toledo. Well, that'll do it. Yeah, that'll do it. <laughs> and, um, he was on unemployment. His unemployment was running out and he had a couple little girls and he didn't know what he was going to do. And Penny and I weren't really sure, but uh, at the time I was. I was answering emails in the morning, going out after lunch, packing boxes until four o'clock when UPS showed up, putting the boxes on the UPS truck and then getting out guitars for Zach to set up the next day and then going back into my office and answering emails until eight o'clock at night and making sales calls, going home, sleeping, coming in in the morning, answering emails, doing books until noon, going out in the warehouse, packing up boxes. I mean, it was it was crazy. And we were start things were starting to happen. And I'm like, you know, I, I'm going to put him in the shop and get him in charge of moving all these guitars around and doing all this stuff. And so I hired him and then I needed to hire somebody to help me do sales. And I hired another friend of mine that worked in music retail here in Toledo for, uh, for eight years. And the music store that he was working at was one of the ones that closed down oh, um, yeah. in the economic downturn. And he sold, all the major brands in a huge music store here in town and he needed help. So initially I just hired people that I knew that had experience doing what I needed them to do. And then one day you wake up and all of a sudden you, all your friends are working for you and you don't have any friends anymore. You have employees. <laughs> 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 and, uh, but, but no, I, it, it's, it's been really smooth. Um, and, and then Penny started coming in full time as my kids got bigger and dealing with our marketing company. And then we hired an ad agency and I needed Penny to be the go between, between us and sort of the ad agency and pay attention to them. And now I have four guitar techs and a shipping guy and I'm looking for another guitar tech. And I have an in-house IT guy and a sales guy and an office manager. And I just hired one of my, one of the first interns that we had in here from a local college. She did such a killer job interning with us, um, that I, I hired her to help in sales this summer. Nice. Um, and she's awesome. And I, you know, I don't, it's very, very hard to judge yourself. I think to get a perspective on yourself, I think I'm very, very approachable. I think these guys like me, they still hang out with me after hours every once in a while. I, you know, I play in bands with some of them (laughs) (laughs) and, uh, and that's that's okay. (laughs) You know, um, I, I don't, I'm probably not as tough as I should be, you know, at times, but I genuinely love what I do. And I think that comes through and I think it makes the people that want to work for me, want us to 
succeed. Well, I think that you know? uh, I would say that tr- uh, love uh, trumps toughness. Uh, yeah, you know, and uh, I would always, you know, I would always say that. <laughs> it, it, it seems like uh, you know. So now we're doing about two and a half million dollars a year, and there's not a lot left after everything is paid around here. You know, the with the rent and the payroll and all the taxes and all the the things that it's a, it's a small business. It's it's not easy, you know. But uh, the people that are here seem to be sticking with me for a company that can't really afford to provide insurance and stuff at this point. You know what I mean? But I want to, that's the plan. You know, the plan is to be, is to be successful enough to be able to do that for everybody. And I think everybody knows that. And, I, and, and, and when I, because I'm honest with these guys, I think these guys tend to be honest with me. And like we started running into a situation last year where I think everybody in the building was just maxed out and you can't, have everybody be maxed out all the time. No. You know what I mean? So that's why we're, we're looking at bringing some more, bringing in a couple more people to help sort of relieve the, the pressure valve as it were. And the, the funny thing about that is, is that I don't, I'm not the kind of guy that, that runs around back there and is like, how many guitars do we get out today? Oh, I need to get this in. I need to get that in. Oh, this has to go. What, what, what are we doing? What's I never do that. These guys impose that pressure on themselves. So well, that's a that's that, that's a gift. That must mean we're we're doing something right. It sounds here. like you know what a, I mean. It sounds like it. Do you feel like you're on? Uh, and I guess this could work into my sort of my my own clothes, and then I'm, I'll give you the final word on it. But I, yeah, man, I, 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 you know, what does the trajectory look like? I mean, I, typically I have a couple of questions uh, written down, but I'll combine them into that. Uh, where do you see it? Where do you see it going? What what things are important to you? You know, and sometimes it's just we're going to take it a day at a time. And other times it's, well, we'd like to do this or that. How does it come out for you? Uh, I'm, I'm going to have to go with the day at a time answer yeah. because That's I don't the most know common, what, by the way, <laughs> I don't know what this industry holds. I guess I guess my whole point of doing this was that I never wanted to necessarily be. Um, a figurehead. I don't want to be the chairman of the board. I'm not interested in going public. I'm not interested in taking a bunch of money from a bunch of investors and being responsible for the direction of their money. Um, <laughs> and that's what it is. I, well, that that's a thing that people do. I mean, people, people get businesses to the point that we're at. And then they're like, well, I'm going to go get some investors and get some cash in here. And then we're really going to blow this thing up. Well, what does that really mean in this business? You know, I've had, I've had 20 years of NAMM shows to watch companies come and go and try to learn from their mistakes. And I think that that's, that's the thing. Um, I, I talk a lot with you, uh, but in a lot of situations I try to be quiet and listen and learn, you know what I mean? Um, and, and, and look around and, and see what my competitors are doing and see, see where their money is really coming from. Um, that pays for their advertising presence and then try to see what they're getting out of that and then watch things when they hit the retail level and see how many things are really selling. I don't, I'm, I'm a firm believer that you can't grow faster than your fan base. Um, and I think there's an opportunity in this business for customers to, for, for manufacturers to get a fan base in their dealer network and sell a lot of guitars to dealers and then not be around when the dealers aren't able to sell them to retailers. Mm. And so my plan is to build up and to continue to try to build a strong customer fan base and have the customer fan base demand access to the guitars from dealers so that when the dealers get stuff from me, they move it. And that is a harder way to do business. And I don't know if, I don't know what I'm limiting myself to by choosing that path. And I don't know what the cap is because there's a big gap between the size business we are and, 
you know, there, there's a handful of, of us down here. G&L is a, is a bigger company than we are, but they're a good example. I mean, they're a big, small company. We're a big, small, we're a big, small business. They're a big, small business. And there's a lot of us that sort of operate between the level of Reverend and G&L and around our sort of area. There's a handful of guitar manufacturers that the small guys look at and think like, oh, they've made it. And I'm like, I have, <laughs> right? And then, yeah. and the, but, but the difference between like what we do and what like Schechter does is many, many millions of dollars. Yeah. Yeah, it's a <laughs> you know, yeah. it, it's a completely different ball game. And, and it would be nice to fall somewhere between where we are and that and be able to really take care of the people that, that work for me and really take care of myself and really have, have Joe being, be taken care of. And the, I mean, these are the kind of, I, I, I tend to think about things in people and in people terms, and that might be horribly naive, but yeah. it seems right mm -hmm. and it's working so far. So I don't really see any reason to sort of rock the boat. Well, you you know what I mean? you've articulated it pretty well. I will just tell you, I, I mean, uh, I just listened to all that and I, I would say I understood it and it makes cool. perfect sense. And it sounds to me like you have a handle on it. Um, so this is the point where you get to tell me your story. Okay, cool. I now, in, in all fairness, I've told this before. So somebody listening to this maybe heard me on some, you know, weird interview somewhere else or well, it's, met me at a, it's possible, me at a but they show. will they will not it's have heard favorite. it here. They will not have heard yeah. it here. So <laughs> I mentioned Mike Watt earlier. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm an old punker, I, which is also a bad cliche for a 50 year old guy to say, but mm -hmm. it's true. Um, I grew up in an era where. Uh, where guitar players were emulating Eddie Van Halen and Steve Vai. And I knew that I was never going to be that kind of a player. And there was a whole slew of music going on with amazing songwriters and amazing guitar players. Um, guys like Steve Edgerton from the descendants and all, and uh, Greg Ginn from black flag and his instrumental band gone that I sat and learned how to play all of the riffs on their first two records, you know, uh, note for note and Bob Mould from who's who do. And, and I loved that style of music. And one of my favorite bands when I was a kid was a band called the Minutemen on SST records mm -hmm. and the Minutemen singer D Boone passed away in 1986 when I was 15. And, um, was replaced by, it wasn't really replaced, but the, the remaining guys in the Minutemen, this Mike Watt, who I was talking about, and their drummer, George Hurley, uh, were stalked and eventually led into being in a band with a guy named Ed Crawford from here in Ohio. And they went on to form this band called Firehose, which in my mind is still one of the greatest bands of all time. It combines everything that was great about um, the attitude of of all of that alternative music of that era, the, the, what people don't remember is right before New Nirvana, there was like an era of sort of punk rock music where there was guitar solos and stuff and <laughs> like all kinds of crazy musicianship. Brian Baker from Dag Nasty ripped amazing leads. And the, these, these are the bands that I listened to. And Firehose was that only there was a, like a CCR sort of folkiness about them. Uh, clean tone guitars, tellies into deluxes and Les Paul uh, gold pop. P90s later yeah. when they got a little more aggressive sound, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And and Mike Watt's bass drove that band crazy bass lines, just which is why you know the the people who we think of as the greats of the bass, you know, from that era and from er, you know, all cite this guy as an influence and all became fans of him. You know, your Getty Lee's and and your Les Claypools and your fleas and stuff all refer to Mike Watt as, you know, I mean, obviously Getty was around before Watt, but as a fan, they're all fans, right? So this guy plays this killer bass. And when we started making basses again in 2011, we did some early ones. We had a couple of connections to Mike. Uh, first off, I probably saw Firehost play 30 times in the 80s. And Mike was one of these guys that sat on the edge of the stage and sold T-shirts after every show. <laughs> and I would buy a T-shirt from him and have a beer with him and talk about him. Well, years went by and we, uh, Reverend, worked with the Stooges. We did a signature model for Ronnie Ashton. Um, and Joe Naylor and Ron Ashton were very good friends. And Mike 
got the nod to join the revised Stooges in 2005. And so we would see Mike Watt backstage at Stooges shows and he would look at me and be like, oh, it's the Detroit San Pedro connection, man. How you doing, buddy? You know, and I was just like flabbergasted that he remembered, but he's that guy. Yeah. And so um, I asked him if he would let us do a, take a crack at doing a signature model with him. And, and we had a few different connections, not just through the Stooges and through this personal thing, but Joe Naylor's cousin, Mike Naylor, lived out in Southern California. And he, um, he was partners in a company called CD Rollout, which did like the disc makers thing back then. And they worked with Mike on a lot of his solo stuff. And so Mike felt this sort of brotherly connection to the Naylor family. And so Mike said to me, you know, Ken, I love you and Joe, uh, but I, I just... I sort of do my own thing. And as much as I like your bases, I don't really want to put, you know, my name on something you do. And I said, no, Mike, you're not understanding me. I want to make your base. I want you to talk to Naylor because Naylor has this uncanny ability to listen to these artists and, and, and then listen to them, try to articulate the sound that's in their head and then take the, 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 physics and make the instrument that makes that sound. I've seen him do it over and over again. And I knew he could do it with Watt. And I told Watt, we, we want to make the bass that you play. We want to, we want to correct, you know, if you have this thing where you really like this about this bass, but you really like this about this bass, but I know you're playing short scales now because you're getting older in your hands. And so you want this and that. I think we can do that. And I don't know if Mike believed me or not, but he gave me the go ahead and he and Joe, got together and they talked about this thing. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we went through five years of prototypes. And for the first couple, few years, we would only see Mike when he came through town and we would have a base for him and he would take it and he'd be like, oh, this is cool. And then he'd get back to us in a couple of weeks. Well, this could be better. This could be better. And he told us later, he didn't think we were ever really going to get there, oh. <laughs> which is great. <laughs> and um, one time he came to town and we had a prototype for him and without even plugging it in, he sat at the bar and put it in his lap. He hit two notes on it and went, I could just see his face. I could just see it. Fellas, we're onto something. And then he just like started, okay, so what we need to do is, you know, and all this, all this excitement. Um, and within, you know, a, f a few months of that meeting, we had the thing pretty much done. And in the winter of 2017, uh, January, 2017, NAMM show, we launched it. Um, at NAM, and I had Mike come in and sit in the booth and people were coming up and interviewing him and I, people from base magazines were like tearing up, you know, and I was like, Oh, this is awesome. Cause this guy's a legend. He's never done anything like this and we're doing it. You know, we made it happen. And, um, so he played our, our NAM party and it, it was at a place called the slide bar in Fullerton. And, um, and and he and Reeves Cabrales played together, which is another, it's like two of my heroes. Yeah. And I'm standing there as two of my heroes meet for the first time because, you know, Reeves played with Bowie and Mike played for Iggy. Mm -hmm. And these guys have heard about each other for years and years yeah, and years. That's and, years. Funny. and then they finally see each other and they're like, it was just like instant, you know? And I'm like, I can't believe that I, I get to be a part of this. Like these guys are here because of what we do. Yeah. It's an, it's amazing. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> and um, and Watt takes the stage, and he plays this super old Minutemen song called Joe McCarthy's Ghost, which is just this awesome song with this incredible bass line. And I'm standing six feet away from him, and it's starting to hit me that Mike Watt's standing there playing my bass. It says Reverend. <laughs> it, it, like, there it is. And then the second song he played is a song called Forever One More one reporter's opinion, which was an old Minuteman song that he redid on one of his solo records. It's my favorite song of all time, probably. And he busts into the song and I just burst into tears. And my wife comes over. She's like, this is, she just said, she said to me, I know, I know exactly what you're feeling. I get it. It's awesome. And it is, it's awesome. And that, that's what this is about. Like that moment is what all of this is about. And when I'm running around this building and I'm like, oh, this isn't coming together right or oh, this, you know, blah, 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 whatever. I remind myself of that standing there and being being fortunate enough to be that guy that had that experience because that experience just is the greatest feeling in the world. You've really defined something and I, I, I'm not going to 
uh, spend any time on it because time is now uh, uh, yeah, leaving us. Point. But um, yeah. it's a great tool. I, I'm always a, a big believer that, um, you know, we, we need to have these fallback ideas and fallback thoughts that we can interject when we're in situations where we feel like things are going south. And, you know, sometimes it's I mean, most of the time, you know, as I end the show, I will end it again for the 66th, 60, uh, 6th if I can say that time, uh, yeah. with, uh, you know, the old stay positive and stay focused on the destination, but most importantly, keep all the options open on how you're going to get there. And, um, you know, maybe that'll be on my headstone, but, but it's <laughs> exactly how I have learned to live my life and run my business and knowing that um, the destination is what matters you don't have to always know how you're going to get there, but you will know. But as long as you stay focused and you move in that direction. And, and part of it is that we have to get out of the way and, uh, yeah. you know, and, and, and let things fall into place naturally and know that that they will. And because when we try to fight it, and you've probably experienced this, uh, we try to set up a narrow path, a narrow expectation you know, we've set ourselves up for some kind of failure. So you've got that great tool to uh, to fall back on and that vision that just uh, aligns perfectly with where you're going and uh, gives you that long term approach to deal with things in the short term. And so I, I have confidence that uh, you're going in the right place. And I'm certainly going to look forward to watching and seeing how things uh, evolve in the coming days, weeks, months and years. And I do well, appreciate. Thank you, thank you for having me. Yeah, up. no, I really appreciate it, and uh, yeah. look forward to to uh, checking up and, uh, and and checking in at, at a later time. And thanks so much for coming on. You bet. Thank you, sir. So, what did you think of the interview with Ken Haas? We always want to hear from you. You can do that easily through the official episode page on our website at guitarbusinessradio.com or on Facebook and Twitter at Guitar Business, or email us directly at contact at guitarbusinessradio.com. And you know the drill. Of course, if none of that is working for you, just call us on our GBR hotline at 888-777-2404. You can do that right now if you like, or later. Operators are currently looking for second jobs. If you call right now, they may change their minds. So that was another long interview, but... Uh, that seems to be the trend on this show, and maybe it's because I'm not constantly interrupting and trying to be an equal talker on the show. It, it's not that I don't have anything to say or add, but, you know, I do my talking at the front and back of the show. So, you know, like right now, but most of our listeners are tuning in to, to hear the guest, and I want to provide the best possible environment for them and give them a chance to talk in depth on the subjects we bring up. So in that regard, I think my job is to be a good listener and, and encourage that depth of discussion. And that seems to be generating these long interviews. Maybe that means we're doing something right. I hope so. If we are, let us know once in a while. That's quite helpful. Now, there was a lot of information in our discussion with Ken, but one of the things that caught my ear near the end of the interview, and, and I commented on it at the time, was his realization of why he was doing what he was doing. What made it worth it? I'm talking about the moment where he's seen Mike Watt playing the signature bass they had been working on for like five years. I said that little bit of knowledge was something he could store and remember any time he needed some clarity of purpose. And that idea can apply to all of us in one way or the other, don't you think? This is kind of parallel to what I said in the front of the show about reviewing all that you've accomplished over the longer term at times when you feel like you're not getting anything done. But this idea of why you're doing what you're doing is really even bigger in my view. If that's not clear, you're kind of operating on thin ice, so to speak. At any time, it could become clear that you actually have no clarity of purpose and you may lose incentive to continue in the direction you're going. Now, in some cases, that may be necessary. There are times when we have to alter our course for any of many reasons, and we should be clear about that too. But from time to time, it's helpful to reinforce your bigger purpose. There are many ways you might go about that. In any event, I would always advise you to stay positive, 
Stay focused on your destination, but so important. Keep all the options open on how you're going to get there. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you next week on Episode 67. And that's it for this episode of Guitar Business Radio. Thanks for being with us. You can stay tuned and stay in touch at guitarbusinessradio.com. 